Good morning, Stan Stahl here with Secure the Village. Welcome to our monthly webinar. This month, we're gonna be talking about getting cyber prepared, incident response and business continuity. So uh, first, as always, thank you to our sponsors. This month, they're uh, Citadel, my company, and Merriman and Associates, uh, Incident Response Investigations and Digital Forensics. Um, I'm your guide. We'll be talking to our guests this, uh, this, this episode, Brad Merriman, who's the president of Merriman and Associates, and Pat Fraioli, who's the managing, managing director of MRM Capital Holdings. Brad, why don't you introduce yourself? Good morning, all. Brad Merriman, uh, Merriman and Associates. We're a digital forensics and cyber investigations firm, uh, handling everything from civil and criminal litigation uh, to uh, investigation of breaches and uh, compromises of, of network and personal security systems. Cool, good. Thank you for being here, Brad. And uh, Patrick? Yeah. So many of you have known me for uh, the last 30 years as an attorney, uh, most recently with Irvin Cohn and Jessup. Um, once an attorney, always an attorney. Uh, and uh, most recently, the last 10 years as a privacy and security attorney, uh, I'm still doing some of that, but also um, moving into the field of private equity and management consulting. Uh, and so I'm still uh, doing the attorney uh, work, but also uh, a lot more private equity and management consulting. Cool. Uh, glad you're both here. Um, let's get started with um, kind of the theme for the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, two two different perspectives on this. Um, one from one of my mentors, Barry Baim. I had the, the great pleasure of working with Barry uh, 30 years ago. We were uh, both at uh, TRW at the time. And one of Barry's mantras was failing to plan is planning to fail. And uh, the corresponding theme, uh, something from Dwight Eisenhower, uh, both general and, and president who said, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So let's kick off the discussion with with that as the the general subject. And go ahead. You're 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 both experts at, at the these these two themes, if you will. So uh, Brad, why don't you jump in? Surely, I I think I I, I certainly agree with both gentlemen, but uh, perhaps even more so with uh, uh, General Eisenhower. Uh, the whole concept that that plans are. Um, are useless. I'm not sure I completely agree with that, but it's mm -hmm. the second portion of that. The planning is indispensable. The, the act of the planning, uh, I believe, is really what pays dividends when it comes time to actually dealing with an event or an incident. Uh, the plans may get thrown out because the specifics of them are, are no longer applicable, but if you've done your due diligence during the planning phases, you, you know the basics of what you have as resources, you know who to contact, and you pivot from there. Uh, you adjust your systems and your your plans, if if they're still applicable, uh, to the, to what's before you. So I, I think that uh, I agree with him that the planning is absolutely indispensable. And you can either do it ahead of time, or you can spend twice as much time during trying to do that planning during the heat of the battle. Yeah, good and point. You know, and you know, you you don't really have the time during the heat of the battle. And, and specifically during a breach uh, incident, you don't really have the time to do that kind of planning during the heat of the battle. You need to be able to have done that planning in advance. And you know, General Eisenhower's greatest uh, endeavor was D-Day, the Normandy invasion. And it, it serves as a great example of exactly what this is because there were plenty of specific plans of how D-Day was going to go. And once it started, it all fell apart. Ships ended up in the wrong place. The tides took people to the wrong beaches. Uh, the Germans had, the, the, the enemy had a say in how it was gonna go and nobody was where they were supposed to be. And yet they improvised because they had done so much planning they knew their goal. They knew where they needed to go. They knew the result they needed to achieve. And they improvised, changed the plan on the fly because they had done so much planning and said, here's how we're going to do it now. 
and that was the result of the planning which is exactly the point mm-hmm. yeah uh, I, I totally agree, and I think to, to keep the metaphor going, and it, Brad, it kind of goes into your area. Uh, part of what let med, part of what made D-Day a success was that part of the planning was being able to uh, unload ship, uh, you know, things off of ships, uh, tanks, and and stuff, uh, 24 hours a day. And you can't start planning for that in the middle of the battle. If you've not planned for being able to, basically, they had to engineer docks that would move up and down with right. the tides, you know, which is an enormous effort. Uh, they had to do that in advance. And it's the same thing. And this is why I said it, it falls into your side of it, Brad. Uh, if in your planning, you're not preparing to do logging, so you don't have the, you, you've got to have those logs available. Uh, when the battle starts, and if you're only going to start turning the logs on when the battle started, it's already too late. I think you know you you and I have talked about that a lot. Certainly, it's, it's if you have not, as part of your planning, have not prepared yourself uh, ahead of time for those incidents or, or breaches or events, then you're absolutely right. You you can't turn these things on and provide anything of real value. Uh, if, if they weren't there for uh, the inception of the event to allow you to tell, you know, how did they get in? What did they initially do? What types, of, what things have they actually looked at or had access to? Uh, what things have they have perhaps exfiltrated information wise from the system? If all that has occurred before you know that what has happened or know that there's been an issue, then you're so far behind the curve, you you might as well just kind of close up shop at that point. <laughs> yes, a- absolutely. Uh, let's jump on to the the next slide, which is just to give some context. What would when we look at cyber sec- uh, incident uh, response, business continuity, um, it, it seems to me that we, we're looking at, at three specific objectives here. Uh, one. We got to get the organization back to work as quickly as possible. Yeah, that, that's 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 one piece. Second, we've got to determine exactly what happened as thoroughly as necessary. And that word necessary is the, the critical piece here because the longer we spend figuring out what happened, the longer it may take us to get back to work as quickly as possible. And the third thing is critical, and Patrick, your your you know domain, if you will, we got to manage the legal exposure. And these are the things that we've got to plan. And, uh, to accomplish uh, ahead of time. Uh, I want to jump into the next slide just to give an illustration of the kinds of things that we're we're talking about here. Um, these, what, what you're seeing on the screen um, is a set of some of the bad things that can happen, some of the incidents, loss of information, denial of service, misuse of services, unauthorized changes to things, uh, loss of critical servers, external network disruptions, all of those. Some of those are going to affect confidentiality and privacy. Some of them are going to affect business continuity. Uh, for many medium-sized and smaller companies, the planning is the same to make sure, you know, figure, you know, th- those three objectives that, that, that we just had. Uh, so kind of with that in mind, let's then go to the next slide here. Uh, what's the role of forensics and investigations? And, and Brad, you speak to this so well because ultimately this is this is the factual part of it. What's the evidence at all? So go ahead, Don. Why don't you jump in and uh, kind of take us through this this particular slide? I, thank you, Stan. I, absolutely. I mean, at, at this point, once we're called in, or, or if, if I may look at it from the standpoint of the, of the client, the business uh, or entity that's been affected, I, there's the initial question. I mean, you may see red flags of anomalies in your network or something may seem a bit amiss, but there's the, still the question is, have we been compromised? I mean, is this something that's uh, an irregularity within a software or within our network structure or something like this? and something that we can handle internally that's just an accident or a mistake in configuration? Or is this something intentional where someone has come in and is reconfiguring or pilfering or uh, adjusting our own information, taking our information? So that initial part is 
what has to be discovered at first. Do I, am I really compromised? Has there really been an event here that requires further concentration, further look at what's occurring uh, to determine whether we can recover quickly? Do we have a liability involved? Uh, if we are compromised, it really goes to the next question is, was that compromise leveraged? Um, many, many companies have actually been compromised uh, and laid, they lay dormant uh, until such time as someone wants to take advantage of that compromise. Others, the compromise occurs and the, the leveraging or the uh, taking advantage of that compromise uh, takes place almost immediately. So it's a matter, okay, now was it leveraged? Uh, did I lose information, trade secrets, uh, personal, personally identifiable information, uh, things that I need to make reporting on? Uh, or is it something that may have been uh, information that will wind up being in falsified wire transfers or uh, ACH type transactions that may occur because they now have that kind of background to fraudulently mimic the company in those pursuits? So do we have a financial loss? Have, have I lost you know, information that is important to the company and to the clients? Uh, then it jumps to the, the physical, okay, if I've determined that I do have something like that, what am I going to look at? Uh, do I have the logs and artifacts to actually indicate attribution or origin or even to the point of what was actually touched? Um, what were the actions that were transpiring in the background? Uh, even though someone may take advantage of you for one particular reason, doesn't mean that they don't double down and do other things beyond that. Let's say they want to gain information uh, for identity fraud. They collect that information about your clients, they're pilfering the PII, but in the meantime, they're also gaining information about trade secrets that they may be able to sell or leverage somewhere else. So just because there's one principal uh, issue behind the compromise doesn't mean that they don't leverage it to multiple types of sources. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'm always, you know, when, when I see like this this slide, and, and particularly, do we have the logs and artifacts, etc. Uh, I recall an, an incident you and I participated in. Uh, we were called by a company that had been notified by the FBI that one of their computer IP addresses had shown up in a investigation that was all the fbi said so they called us we called you brad you were able to look at the device in question identify that it had been compromised in fact just like the fbi had suspected but you were able also to determine because of the logs and artifacts that were there that nothing was exfiltrated and with nothing being exfiltrated there was no need for a breach disclosure and, and I've, that has always struck me as, you know, it's it's not just that, oh, my God, we got a breach. Now we've got a, all this legal stuff. Sometimes the data, the logs and stuff can be on your side. And you because you've got that because of the planning. Now, you don't have to make that breach disclosure. Um, Kind of, you know that that kind of difference, and 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 that's I'm going to jump on to the next slide because that gets us into the legal framework for all of this. Uh, and and Patrick, you talk about this. You're all, you're the you're our you're our lawyer on the panel. So, yeah. Sure. So there's really two things going on here from from a legal standpoint. Once you've had a breach, you have an obligation to do several things. First, you've got an obligation to find out what happened. Your obligations there are going to be driven by the statutes in your state and possibly in other states, and now increasingly by um, further statutes, including everybody's talking about GDPR, which is the European um, the European Union's statute that governs its its citizens and its businesses. So <clears throat> whatever jurisdiction your business is subject to, you are going to have to get the legal advice that says this jurisdiction, your business is subject to it. 
this is the statute that determines what you have to do. So it could be one state, could be 12 states, could be 49 states, could be you know 18 states if you're an e-commerce business like we've had and and three European countries or at, at the moment now, all of the European countries, uh, yeah. GDPR. Um, and you're gonna have to do certain things. The, the obvious thing, we've all been through this as, as consumers, is you have to notify. <clears throat> so you have to notify if PII, if personal information has been compromised, you have to notify the people whose information has been compromised. Okay, everybody's somewhat familiar with that at this point. The question is, each state has a different uh, regime. They're, for the most part, somewhat similar, but you'd be surprised. Um, there are several states that have very short clocks, very quick timeframes uh, by which you have to notify. Um, and you have to notify both the regulator as well as the individuals. Um, and in a couple of those jurisdictions, most notably uh, Puerto Rico, you have to notify the regulator and the regulator is going to post it on their website. Um, so you not only have to notify the individuals, you have to notify the regulator. Um, there are other requirements, other requirements like you have to offer, especially in California, you have to offer um, identity theft protection. Now, notice I said offer, not you have to provide. You you write the letter and you offer it. And what we're finding is that less than 10%, usually actually less than 5% of the, of the people actually accept the offer of identity theft protection. That's good for you for the business because you don't have to spend all that much money on it, but you do have to offer it. <clears throat> um, the question will be, who are the affected individuals? That will depend on the statute. And that will depend on the way you've kept the information, which again goes back to your planning, which is not only planning for the breach, but planning for privacy in the first place, which they call privacy by design. What information are you keeping? And this is something that Stan has always preached. What are we keeping? Where are? Where is it? How do we protect it? So what what information do we have to keep how long do we have to keep it do we have some sort of tickler or trigger and how do we know when to get rid of it um if you don't have to keep it throw it out because <laughs> it can't be breached Very true. If, yes. you if you don't if you don't need if you mm -hmm. don't have it anymore yeah um, and that's why you want to be i hate this word proactive but you want to be active in thinking about what information you have to keep uh, and that's why you should have an annual review in order to determine, and that's a privacy review more than a cybersecurity, so to speak, review. But but don't get caught up in the labels. It's really sort of the same thing. And those these that's where these two things come together. Whether they call it privacy or cybersecurity, it's really the same thing because you're planning for a breach or you're planning, hopefully planning to avoid a breach. And what you're trying to do is minimize the effect of a breach if it happens by not having as much information available to be breached. And inevitably, people just leave things lying around. And then when the breach happens, they go, oh, gee, we didn't even need that anyway. So, you know, that's when you kick yourself. Yeah. So regulators, the reason I have the 500 there is California has a particular uh, rule that says if more than if the the personal information of more than 500 individuals was compromised in your breach then you have to notify the California Attorney General in addition to notifying the individuals that's just one little extra thing that excuse me um, you would rather not have to notify the regulator because then the yeah. California Attorney General will publish um, your breach on its website. And you'd rather not have to do that. That's right. So uh, it's nice if it's less than 500 people uh, in your breach. Um, when, it's, when it comes to HIPAA, of course, all HIPAA breaches are published on the 
HIPAA, quote, wall of shame. Um, so you're not going to get around that with less than 500. But certainly you're going to have to deal with regulators. That's one of your obligation. And it's your obligation to know which regulators regulate your business. And that's important. Um, that is the kind of thing you want to have. I mean, you probably know that anyway, but you want to have an attorney who's competent who can help you with that. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you, you need to find out who, what, where. That's what Brad is going to help you uh, with. Absolutely. You need to know when did this happen? Who did it? You know, what happened? And the thing is, when it comes to your obligations and the legal framework and the regulators asking questions or, or law enforcement asking questions, you have to disclose what you've learned. You can't say, well, I don't really want to tell you that. If it's law enforcement or the, um, the regulators asking those questions, you're going to have to answer the basic questions of who, what, where, when, how, why. Now, turning to the right side of the page, when it comes to protecting the company, this is a different type of analysis. Now you're doing it simultaneously, which is why you really do have to do your planning in advance. Because here, you're not doing an analysis of who, what, where, when, how, why. What you're doing is you're saying, oh boy, whatever happened here, we need to make sure the company doesn't go under because of this. And so whatever we're finding out over there, how can I make sure the company doesn't face liability from this? Either from the internal people who, who's, um, whose information was compromised, that would be our employees or our clients, our customers, et cetera, whose information we were holding, or um, from uh, people outside the company who are going to file class action against us. That is where you have to retain counsel. And hopefully you've got counsel in advance, again, planning, because you need from the very beginning to have counsel retained and have that counsel retain the people who are doing the investigation and are then reporting to the counsel because you want everything that is discussed in this vertical, if you will, to be privileged. You do not want to turn over the answers to these questions or these discussions. You don't want these to be turned over to law enforcement or regulators. These are different discussions. And so this entire vertical here is attorney directed. And these are the kinds of things where you want to include your HR director because you're having discussions about your employees and about how to talk to your employees because some of your employees might be pissed and they might want to sue the company. And you're going to want to talk about how to disclose this to your employees. And those can be sensitive conversations. Sometimes you talk to them, depending on the type of company, you have, depending on the type of employees you have, depending on the type of relationship you have, you might want to talk to each one individually. You might want to have a big, you know, meeting with everybody and have a question and answer session. You know, I've, I've, I've been through this with lots of companies and everybody does it differently. And it all depends. It depends on the, the, the CEO, it depends on the HR person. It depends on the company. It depends on all, all these individual things. Um, you do have an attorney client privilege and you can use it, but you have to be really thoughtful in advance about how to use it and what the limits of it are. And along those lines, <clears throat> one of the issues that you'll come across is, is insurance. Now, obviously a terrific way to protect the company is insurance. Yet obviously have to have thought about that in advance and have to have paid for it in advance. Um, but insurance is not the be all and end all. And insurance, of course, has exclusions. There's lots of exclusions. You need to have thought about those in advance. You need to talk to your broker. Um, and you need to be very clear about what those ex exclusions will be. But also remember that the insurance company is not your friend necessarily. 
And you want to talk to the insurance company with your attorney at the time when there's a breach, because they're not necessarily going to just say, oh, sure, absolutely. This is why you've been paying all those premiums. Here you go. Here's a big check. And congratulations. Here you go. Here's all your money. Um, the insurance company will not necessarily, you know, work with you. They may, they may be great and they may not. And you just have to see some are great, some are not. Um, but also when it comes to insurance, you may not want to disclose everything to the insurance company. And that's something you have to talk to your, your, uh, attorney about. Now, I'm certainly not going to tell you to defraud the insurance company. You know, you have to be very careful there. Uh, you have an obligation to, to be um, candid with the insurer. But that's something you've got to discuss with your attorney. And you need to make sure that you understand the relationship you have with your insurer when it comes to cyber insurance. And there's two kinds of insurance. There's cyber insurance and crime insurance. And while they, the Venn diagrams, the, the two circles intersect, they're not identical. Um, and so, again, it's just something that you've got to plan in advance and think about in advance. Because once yeah. this is in motion, it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. the, again, the overriding point is that you decide what to disclose. In this vertical, you are deciding what to disclose and to whom. Because remember, you have, as a company, you have multiple constituencies and stakeholders. You have employees, you have clients, customers, potential clients and customers in the public. You have shareholders, uh, whether it's a private or a public company. And if it's a public company, it's a whole different ball of wax with public statements and things and SEC. And you have management, and you have all kinds of people uh, and the families of the 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 um, uh, people who work there because you know think about think about a uh, think about law enforcement right if if you have let's say you're the, the the payroll company for law enforcement or something like that where or anthem i remember talking to the people at anthem right after they got breached well they had all kinds of law enforcement who mm -hmm. they represented. That's and right. A lot of people there were undercover and they were breached. And all of a sudden, oh my goodness, can you imagine the families of those undercover people? You know, so you've got a lot of issues that you, you need to deal with the stakeholders. And uh, that was one reason why, in that case, they had, even though they only had to under California law, give one year of uh identity theft they gave too yeah you know as as i'm listening to you patrick on on this slide and uh back to the slide just before this brad mm -hmm. the things you were discussing um you know i it, it's it just seems to me if you will obvious although i realize so very little is obvious until you know it and then it becomes obvious yeah this, these are just become all the reasons why the planning is so fundamental. I mean, just, I mean, you just went through an entire litany, Pat, of the legal side of, of this that just begs for, hey, let's not try to do this by the seat of our pants when we're in the middle of a battle. Brad, the things you talked about on the forensic side, same thing. Let's not go through this uh, for the first time in the heat of battle. By then it's too late, you know, if, if, if that's when you start your planning, um, to your point from the earlier slides. So with that, let's go on and, and let's, okay, so what does planning look like, if, if, if you will? And um, if you've been following these webinars, you've seen this chart uh, at least twice before. Uh, it's the NIST cybersecurity framework, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Uh, the objective of what we're talking about with both incident response and business continuity is the uh, it, at the end of the game. We want to be at recovery. We want to get the business back up and running, et cetera, et cetera, as, as, as we talked about. As you go through the 19, 20 items, sub items here, so many of them touch on being able 
to effectively get back uh, get back to business, figure out what needs to be done, um, what what needs to be uh, done during during the plan, et, et, et cetera. Um, so it's like we can see kind of moving across this horizontally, if you will, uh, beginning the elements of 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 of, uh, of incident response and business continuity planning. The first critical piece of this that kind of shows up is that like so much else in, in, in business and particularly when technology interfaces with it, uh, you need a team. You need a group of people with subject matter expertise, particular training, uh, and particular abilities, responsibilities, and capabilities here. Uh, we're looking at, again, in the language of the webinar series, the information security manager has got to be a, a part of, of this team. Uh, the appropriate executives in every organization is going to be different. CEO, COO, CFO, Patrick, to your point, certainly HR, the IT infrastructure, the CIO, IT director, if there are IT vendors, a lot of companies, mid-market and smaller companies, won't have IT on staff. They'll outsource that. That outsourced IT vendor needs to be part of the team. Uh, there's got to be subject matter expertise. Brad, what you bring to the table. Uh, that doesn't have to be a capability that's there 24 by 7, but the relationship has got to be built, and the planning has got to include that that uh, that, that subject matter expertise. The same with, with, with what we do on the information security management side. The legal counsel, Patrick, uh, what you do and, and your pieces of this, and, and public relations as as well has to be so that you've got your plan the team has built the plan and the event happens whether it's a ransomware attack uh it's the fbi calling and saying hey we're seeing something suspicious um it's brian krebs calling and saying hey uh i understand that a number of the credit card companies uh a number of credit cards where you're the common point of purchase are showing up on on uh, the the black market for sale. What do you have to say about this? I'm going live in three hours. You better act quickly. All of that and and public relations, of course, have to be on 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 the team. Um, Patrick, you said something as we were preparing for this uh, as well about the role of the HR director in this, and I found it particularly. Uh, you know, uh, in, in a sense, profound, prescient, if, if you will. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the CEO, the COO, when this happens, they are going to be focused on the business. They've got to deal with internal, external, you know, they've got to deal with shareholders and, you know, clients, customers calling, uh, they're just doing everything they can to get things calmed down and keep the business going. The HR director has to deal with the people. Yes, yeah. He or she really has to keep the ship calm and, and really has to calm everyone's nerves. And yeah. that's a critical function in all of this because the because the people start freaking out. They don't know what's going on and they don't know what has happened. And the CEO and the COO often don't have those skills. And they kind of, I don't, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exaggerate a little <laughs> for a moment, just to say they kind of don't care at the moment. And it's not because they're bad people, it's because they have to think the, in the big picture. That's their job, that's their role, is to mm -hmm. take care of the business, the big picture. And it's the HR person who is used to holding hands and being on a more human, personal level. And that's important and it can't get lost because it, it kind of, and it kind of ties into something else that um, I, I always talk about <clears throat> in this. When you're dealing with the regulators, um, as a business, um, your attitude matters. Whether you're the lawyer representing the company, whether you're the company itself, uh, 
I always remind people that there's there are a lot of statistics that say, you know, doctors don't get sued for committing malpractice. Doctors get sued more often for acting like jerks after they commit malpractice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And acting like I didn't do anything wrong. And, and, uh, and that's just a fact. If you take responsibility, if you are contrite, if you act like a human being and a person, mm -hmm. people understand, you know, you're not the first company to get breached. You know, this happens. People understand that things happen. Yeah. Um, just be human. And the HR person is the usually the person who, you know, obviously the HR person has a relationship with all the humans, with all the human resources. The model I see here uh, very much is in uh, the, the plane that uh, landed on the Hudson River a couple of years ago. They made the movie with Tom Hanks, you know, Sully. He's the CEO, COO. He's got to land that plane. He can't be busy with the passengers. That's the role of the attendants to do exactly. that. And correspondingly, the same thing, Brad, you know, there's somebody's got to be keeping track of the evidence, what's going on. You know, somebody's going to have to come in and look at the black boxes, so to speak. Well, and yeah. actually to back up just a little bit, I mean, from a standpoint of HR, uh, many of the people that are affected are actually going to be part of the responders, uh, the inside responders. Yes. If you're not taking care of them and uh, allaying their fears, it's going to be very difficult for them to concentrate on the job at hand. Yeah, yeah. Very, very well said. Am, as, am I as losing well. my job? Am I, you know, is the company going under? Uh, you know, all sorts. Of, the worst case scenario always runs through people's mind. And mm -hmm. if you've got someone who's there to try to, you know, keep things a little more balanced, this is no look, it's, you know, it's too early to talk about those things. You know, we're doing the right thing now. Let's continue to do that. And we'll, if we do all those things, yeah. then we'll come out the other end okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very well said. And again, it's it's the natural segue to our our, our next slide, um, which kind of lays out uh, the the graphic, if you will, is is something our company's put together um, based on there's some some reference there national standards ISO the NIST 800 161 incident handling guide and so on. But we see you know there's there's five phases and we're we're talking about the planning and preparing phase. But then it leads to detect and report, assess and decide, respond and recover, and what's so often missed the lessons learned. You know what did we learn here that uh, will help us the the next time. So. This chart uh, begs the question of, okay, what do you do first when something happens? You know, and uh, the the first thing you've told me, both of you, as we were planning this thing, uh, planning this webinar, check your plan. Whoa, obvious, right? Something just happened. Pull out your plan, get your team together, or at least the parts of the team that are necessary in that moment, and figure it out. And you know that takes you all the way down to assess and 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 decide. And then, okay, um, we just had a, a client needed to go through their plan. Their insurance policy says you have to call us first thing. Well, is that really right? Lawyer, jump in here, Patrick. Do you really call the insurance company first? What do you do? Well, you know, I well, I would never, um, I would never say don't do what your insurance policy says you must do. Well, that's uh, basically political of you. Yeah. I, I also don't think it's wrong to make your first call to your lawyer because you can certainly call the insurance company with your lawyer on the phone. Um, you know, your lawyer is like they always say when when, you know, someone gets arrested, they say, who's your only friend in the world? You know, your attorney. Right. Um, your attorney is obligated by law and, you know, by uh, their oath to look out for only your interest and no one else's. And so your attorney is really should be your first call. <clears throat> and. Um, then you know and 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 also will help you navigate your insurance policy and what do you have to do when you and what should you be saying to your insurer 
and and what do you know you know if it's a cyber if it's a competent if it's if your attorney which they should be someone who understands cybersecurity and privacy then will help you talk to the insurance company and with any luck has a relationship with your insurance company as well um and you know that will also be you know in, in fact maybe that will also be someone who has a relationship with someone like brad because maybe you want to make that first call to brad and then call the insurer mm -hmm. and just sort of get the lay of the land or, or 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 call citadel i mean you really want to have you really want to have a first sort of team call and sort of get a feel for where you are before i think you call the insurer not because it's not because you're viewing the insurer as an adversary but really because you want to have an intelligent call with them first yeah yeah and and, and really, on the same point brad um what are the things you should be looking for to help you determine um what the do you do we need forensics here is this a situation where we want to you know spend the money um frankly you know to figure it all out or is this uh you know we were hit with a phishing attack we blocked the phishing attack maybe that's the end of the story maybe it's not the end of the story i mean how, how do you navigate that piece of it brad well and that's that's a good question stan i mean at that point I, when i mentioned earlier about okay you, you have a red flag there, there's some anomaly that's occurred that's giving everybody you know some concerns is okay now they're starting to ask the right questions it's just that how do we get to the answers and that becomes where you try to bring in someone from the outside hopefully uh that is experienced in those matters and can look directly to the artifacts the logs the uh the things that are present or hopefully are present that can give you some answers to those questions mm -hmm. uh, you're right i mean it, at some point you have to, it, the very first question is is do we really have an incident as i mentioned earlier or is this merely a an accidental misconfiguration or is it a failure of a piece of software uh it, or, or even a device uh but then it becomes a matter of okay what as soon as i start getting answers you then decide okay that takes you down the, the proper path in your plans uh, your plan won't be exactly the plan can be as detailed as you want it may cover you know the the 101 things that can go wrong uh, if it does congratulations for taking the time and effort to, to do that uh, but it, more than likely it's going to have uh, a do, half a dozen to a dozen more general types of things this is okay depending upon what i initially find that allows me to look for that particular set of the plans that uh, that that part or portion of the plan that in, uh, covers this type of activity once you have that then it's okay what am i looking for am i looking for uh, evidence of a breach disclosure uh, you know do i really actually need to have forensics was this merely a uh, were we enrolled in a botnet uh, you know what are those initial things telling you to allow you to make decisions on what happens next yeah. it's those next steps that are all based on your early investigation mm -hmm. yeah i think a well said uh and b it takes you naturally right to our next slide um which is all about okay so what are the things that we got to start in terms of planning and preparation and we're not going to go through a lot of the the info the data if you will on this slide it's it's on the resource kit and all and i'm looking want to be sensitive to the clock as well um but we put down kind of three pieces here there's a lot of stuff for it to do uh there's in making sure backups and images are there and logs and audit information we've already talked about right. system documentation uh restore procedures disaster recovery stuff even power and hvac if you know what are you going to do in the you know we've been talking about incidents as if that's all they are but sometimes there are earthquakes and you know physical things go on and so we need to make sure the power is available and all there's also the organizational piece of it 
Uh, top of the list, because we see it missing so often when we go into our organizations, is this business impact analysis, uh, which is to identify and evaluate the potential effects of an interruption to critical business operations so that you can st strategically manage recovery uh, in accordance with the consequences of an operation being unavailable. Uh, it's far more important, if you will, in like I think all the cases that, you know, if you're a manufacturer, that your manufacturing uh, operations come back up and are, are working um, as more important than, let's say, your marketing operations. So you don't want to spend time bringing back marketing before you brought back operations or inventory management or your finance, your ability to certainly do accounts receivable. Uh, you may delay accounts payable, if I can be a little bit sarcastic here. Um, but those things, you want to have all of that in place. You want to have your staff resources. And Patrick, this is so much of what you've been talking about along HR and your communications as well, the legal side, the public relations side, all of that. Um, the next piece on, on this chart, I just want to spend a moment or two on it, uh, is on testing the plan. I mean, we'll often find better prepared organizations when we walk in, will already do a certain amount of testing on the IT side. Right. They'll regularly do a full restoration from bare metal, let's say, on a server, just Let's make sure it's working right. Let's make sure we got all the documentation right. What we rarely see are tabletop exercises, which brings the team together. A scenario is thrown out. Brian Krebs is about to go live. Get everybody in the room, sit around the table. What do we do? And that that's a piece that I say we, we rarely see. We encourage people to do. And you're, you, both of you are, are participants in those tabletop exercises. You know, um, yeah. Well, yeah. You know, Stan, can you just imagine? Um, I mean, it's now a law in California, in practically every state, I think. It may even be a federal law that you have fire drills. Can you imagine not having fire drills? Mm -hmm. Why do they have, why do we all have to have fire drills and they have the orange vest and somebody's a designated fire marshal? Well, the reason is because people died in fires. Yeah. Well, it, so we have fire drills. Why? So everybody knows when there's a fire, where the fire exits are at a minimum, where the stairs are, what to do during a fire, because the, la the last thing you want to be wondering about and figuring out for the first time during a fire is where's the fire exit? Mm -hmm. You don't want to have to figure that out during the fire when you don't have the time to figure it out. Same thing here. Yeah, you have to yeah. prepare and plan because you, you only have time to execute. You don't yeah. have time to figure so, it out. And, and, and to that point, um, it's one thing to have your plan. Okay, we've written it all down. All right, we've written down where the exits are. And maybe we've even told the people where the exits are. But I remember going all the way back to, well, certainly high school, having fire drills. Everybody, we marched out of the building very methodically, et cetera. That's the table talk exercise mm -hmm. that, that, that you're talking about. The same thing, Brad, let's test our ability to do forensics before the incident. It so really you know, is. If, if I can take it back a little further, I mean, mm -hmm. I, for centuries, law enforcement, or first responders and military has it's been a mantra. You perform as you train. Mm -hmm. uh, the time to, to think about what to do next is not during the moment, as we've said several times before here. It's what did we practice? What did we train for? What did we plan ahead of time? So it's not only having the plan. If the plan is nothing more than uh, a set of, sh of sheets that, that fill a binder and it sits on a shelf somewhere and no no one does anything with them, or updates them, or do, you know, maybe it's a door prop. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yes. then it's, you know, then don't waste the time doing it. Uh, it's not going to perform for you until you actually make it a live, living thing that you've worked with, that you've planned with, and that you've trained with. Yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 that that goes even to the next slide, uh, which begins to 
say, okay, what information do we want to populate in our plan, if you will? Uh, and a lot of it is just basic stuff. Okay, who's your attorney? What's the attorney's cell phone number? This stuff could happen anytime. You know, who's your insurance? Who is, who's your IT vendors, your cloud vendors, your security vendors, companies like ours, companies like yours, the forensic specialists, local law enforcement. It's, you know, you don't want to go to the yellow pages or the online equivalent of the yellow pages to look up, you know, the sheriff's department, the DA's office, FBI, et cetera. Your PR, even your banker and your accountant, those people, you don't know when you're going to need them or not. You need to have that information uh, available. All the systems information that uh, network inventories and diagrams and configure configurations of servers, routers, firewalls, these are things we find missing regularly when we review plans. Does anybody know where all the passwords are? What if it's does do more than one person? Because what if that one person is not available? You know, where are those? And those aren't things you want to write down and leave somewhere either. You got to protect that. Um, do you know where the crown jewels are? You know, are you able to say, well, wait a minute, there's PII over here or over there, or that server has been hit. There's nothing on it that truly matters. All we care, you know, it's hit, it bothers us, but it's not something we have to be concerned about there being PII there. And then all IT is full of checklists and procedures done properly that you want to gather this information because it infuses now what you do in the event of, of an incident. Um, let's go on to the next slide because it goes again to the heart of this whole topic uh, because it's so often not done. It's this, uh, you know, well, what was this? some British prime minister once said that about his opponent that if he stumbled on the truth, he'd pick himself up, dust himself off and walk on as if nothing had happened. You know, you don't want that to be the case in a disaster, in an incident. You want to learn from it. Um, and I mean, here, here again, let, let me ask uh, Brad, let me, you jump in first as to the kind of, what do, what do you see as the, some of the big mistakes that when you go in that, uh, to a situation? I, I think it's, sometimes it's, it's for the fear, uncertainty and, and doubt that, that comes in when you're faced with a, uh, a significant event, something that, you know, could potentially be an extension, extension, extinction level event for your company uh, mm -hmm. or for your career uh, that you you rely too much on the plan. You you either don't follow a plan or you stick to it so closely that you don't allow yourself to pivot where you need to uh, to realize that okay, here's it looked like this in the beginning, but the information that's now coming in looks like it's actually B as opposed to A and not start following B's plan as opposed to A's plan. Mm -hmm. uh, so just being able to uh, keep your wits about you. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's the, that rush to a remediation that uh, you fail to preserve the, the very items that are going to be able to tell you later on that uh, what actually occurred and, you know, what did I actually have a, uh, a reportable offense here? Um, do I need to make notifications if you don't have the proper documentation in hand you pretty much then by default says okay i've got to make notification based on everything it becomes an assumption as opposed to what you're dealing with with actual facts mm -hmm. so uh, once you've had your uh, a couple of things one one of the things I, I failed to mention earlier is when someone raises the flag in your organization that there may be an event, uh, you know, sometimes it's that, you know, we want to kill the messenger. Uh, mm -hmm. The very last thing in the world you want to do is kill the messenger in an event like this. That's the person that they will learn from that. That means they will never tell you again that something has gone wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You will have now eliminated one of your trigger sources uh, to allow you to know firsthand what when something's going wrong. Mm -hmm. Praise that person, I, if even if they're wrong. You know, if they bring it up, says it looks like it's nothing. Uh, still, you, you hold a party. Say, hey, thanks for for telling us. You know, we looked at it. We're okay. We'll, we'll move on. But mm -hmm. tell us again next time. We want to know. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's kind of like uh, when when the dog barks at the uh, someone at the front door, you kick the dog instead of praising the dog. <laughs> it's not going to bark next time. I can guarantee you that. That's uh, true. Those are the yeah. things that you know you really want to do. Uh, but it's looking back at what has occurred. It's failing to assess how you address something, uh, what worked, what didn't work, uh, and then incorporating that back into the plan again, uh, mm -hmm. making it more flexible or at least adding in things that you didn't even think of before that you've now experienced in real life. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and that's well said because uh, there, there's no kind of one size fits all planning, if, if you will, although I mean, our, our company has kind of a generic plan that a lot of our clients will use, but even there, all the who do you contact information and what your server configurations are, all of that is so specialized to each individual organization. Um, and even the way the plan comes together has to be specialized to the organization, which means end of the day when something happens, there's going to be stuff you missed. I mean, nobody is going to spend you know, a hundred dollars to protect paper clips, let's say, as as an example. So there's right. you know a commercial reasonableness over how thorough these plans are, which means that there's always going to be soft opportunities to learn from uh, something when when the event has has happened. Uh, we just got a couple of minutes, Patrick. You want to add to to this slide as well, and then we'll kind of go through the the wind down to the end of the of the webinar. Uh, only that uh, <clears throat> I would say it's important to assess where it says that we assess the plan, what worked and what didn't work. You know, in the in the medical field, uh, they hold what's called an M&M conference uh, anytime a patient uh, right. doesn't make it. And and I think that that's the the sort of spirit in which I would, I, I would do that. It's you know anytime something's done, you you, you really have to just relentlessly and and candidly look at how did we perform what did we do well what did we not do well and really just learn from it be candid and then do better the next time yeah i i i love the word candid I mean, this is not a place for ego to step in the way and no, you know and, not. and be defensive no is the, see, one, one more thing that i'd like to mention about uh, the, the plans uh, that in the lessons learned from from seeing many many plans, um, one of the issues, I spe especially in the notification list of the of the people, is you know I'll see a good list of and there'll be a name, uh, and there'll be a telephone number or an email address next to it, but it doesn't necessarily have their role. A plan is good the moment it's printed. And 13 minutes later, it can be completely different. Uh, there can be a shakeup in personnel, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Your, your firm's a little different now. Mm -hmm. Having the role of that individual, you know, the CEO, okay, everybody knows who the CEO is. Uh, who, who is the, uh, the security manager for a particular uh, network segment, things like this? You, you don't know if, if his name is Sam Smith. If he's not there, he's no longer with the company, he's on vacation. What role was he performing? Mm -hmm. And find someone in that role or associated with that role or responsible for that role. Uh, and then you can contact them. So then you have not reached a stumbling block in your plan. You mm -hmm. actually have people on board who are being uh, yeah. rushing to the flag, if, if you will, when the red flag goes up to, to be able to perform their actions. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to the point of this slide, even as our lessons learned, pay attention to did we miss some of the, you know, was somebody not there and did we not have their right. role identified? Lesson learned. Let's get their roles connected in into all of all of this as as well. Um, Next, as, as we're kind of winding down, there is the resource kit. Uh, these webinars always correspond to resource kit things uh, that we have on the web. Uh, there's the URL for it over the lower right. Uh, and part of the resource kit is getting cyber prepared, incident response and, and, and business continuity. Uh, in terms of where you go from here, if you will, um, basic stuff, start with your team. Put your team together. Have everybody watch this video, uh, notwithstanding the misspelling of the word video over on the, that, that one bullet. Sorry about that. Uh, review the resource kit. There's information on the video that's not on the resource kit, partly because of the dialogue. There's information on the 
uh, resource kit that's not in the video correspondingly and so on. And start planning. And the longest journey begins with a single step. Take that step. That's what we want you to do following up uh, the, the, this, this webinar. Start with your team, get everybody on board, start planning, and follow the, the, what we've been talking about on this webinar. Uh, our next webinar is December 6th. We'll be talking about third-party security management. Uh, some of that is uh, your own vendors who may be... Uh, have access to your network or have access to sensitive information. Some of it can be true third parties. They don't have access, but you're still sharing information with them. So next time, that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, the, the series, as, as you see, we try to be practical, real world, how to, and actionable. Uh, that I, I, I trust, I hope that you felt uh, that way about today's webinar. Here's the full schedule of this uh, kind of a basic curriculum, if you will. Uh, next month is that third party, and then we'll be talking about cyber risk and insurance. A uh, little overview of Secure the Village, our role, our objective, turning people and organizations into cyber guardians. Uh, final slide of uh, who we are, how to contact us. Uh, my company has a free News of the Week, Weekend Vulnerability Patch Report. There's free information as well, lots of it on the Secure the Village website. Please take advantage of that. If you'd like to know about marketing or sponsorship opportunities, just email us or visit our website and we'll help you, uh, we, we'll help you use these to help you market uh, your, your company. So Brad, Patrick, uh, thank you both so very, very much. Any just final words? We're a couple minutes over, but uh, give you a chance to say goodbye and any final thoughts you might have but for me it was one of the first steps again is, is just taking any kind of proactive action uh, viewing this video uh, I, I think is part of that first step uh, and then using this as a launching pad to do the next thing and that's gathering your team together and moving forward super good thanks and pat mm -hmm. Great. same thing plan 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 and uh the spirit of lessons learned is this the whole point of Secure the Village, which is uh, learning from what we've been able to do here and learning from the mistakes of others and learning from the uh, lessons of others. Yeah. So, uh, watch the videos. Great. Well, thank you both. Grateful to you both for being my guests on this. And uh, with that, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.